Of all the fears that grip our hearts, no fear is greater than the fear of death. There are those who will tell you that death is a natural part of life. But if death is just a part of life, then why does it cause us such anger and sorrow? When God created humanity, he intended for us to grow more and more beautiful over time. But in one tragic moment, we unleashed sin into the world and everything broke, including our bodies. Death is the ultimate consequence of sin and it fills God's heart with anger and sorrow even more than it does ours because death was not a part of God's original plan. The Bible says that when Jesus approached the tomb of his friend Lazarus, he quaked with rage and his eyes filled with tears. He was overwhelmed by the suffering caused by death, a curse we had brought upon ourselves. Death's curse was physical. Both the world and our bodies were decaying. But death's curse was also spiritual, eternally separating humanity from their creator, the source of all light, love, and life. But because of God's amazing love, he chose to surrender all power and glory to rescue us from death. Jesus, God's only son, was expelled from the presence of the Father and thrust into complete darkness in our place. He took humanity's curse upon himself, breaking death's grip on us and purchasing humanity a place at the Father's side forever. A day is coming when the true King will return at last to restore the world to its full glory and us with it, renewing both soul and body. You'll still be yourself, but even more so. You'll finally be the real you. On that day, we'll look at each other and say, I always knew you could be like this. I saw glimpses of the real you, flashes of it, and now here you are. Our future is not an ethereal, impersonal one. You're not going to float through the clouds. You're going to walk. You're going to eat. You're going to laugh. You're going to hug. You're going to sing in realms and degrees of power and joy that you cannot now imagine. Some will tell you not to fear death because it's part of life. But Jesus says not to fear death because it's been defeated. And the day will come when Jesus embraces you with his nail-scarred hands and says, Welcome home. I have so much to show you. So we've been going through, and we're finishing up today, a sermon series on faith, extreme faith, having the faith in all things. We've talked about extreme faith uh, personally, and what does your extreme faith look like? We've talked about extreme faith in our giving. We've talked about extreme faith in our family, whether it's our church family unit or our personal family unit or just those that we run in con uh, around. We talked last week about faith in our work and how what does that mean, uh, whether it's our work at our job, work in our family, work in, um, in our community? Today, we're going to look at faith in death. And I know that's kind of a weird thing to talk about, but I figured it's Halloween, so you got to show me grace. Have you ever said this quote? Do you think you're going to get to heaven? Boy, I sure hope so. Have you ever said that? Today, when you leave this building, I don't want you to ever say that again. I want you to say, yes, I am going to heaven. There is not a doubt in my mind that one day I will be embraced by Christ and that he will welcome me home. I think far too often as Christians, we, we want to play Russian roulette with, um, are we going to heaven or not? Well, I think so. I hope so. But if we are truly Christians, then we should absolutely 100% say, I'm going. And when I go, I hope to take everyone I can with me. You ever try to squeeze more people into a bus? 
Come on, we've all done that. I know in college, like, I had a little uh, Monza, Chevy Monza. It was like a little hatchback dome-looking thing. It was one of my favorite cars. It was my first car. I love that car. And truly, comfortably, it fit two in the two front seats. The back seat was about that wide, and if you were over about five years of age, your knees were in your chest or up over your head. And we would squeeze in six to seven adult men in that thing so we could go to Walmart and then we'd buy a bunch of groceries and realize that we had nowhere to put them. We would actually leave people at Walmart, take the groceries back, drive back to Walmart and pick them up. That's what I hope when you, somebody asks you, are you going to heaven, that you faithfully, emphatically say, I'm filling the Monza with every inch of person I can get in there. There may be people hanging out the window. We may have the hatchback open, but I'm taking them all. Because as Christians, we should have the faith that death is done. Death cannot conquer us. Yes, these worldly bodies every day, just be honest. When you wake up, you get one new more pain. You did too much the day before, and now your elbow or your shoulder hurts. You get up and your knees hurt. You get up and you stumble and you, you, or you trip on a toy or you step on a dog's toy and you run into the wall and then you're sore all day. You go get a flu shot or something like that, and then your arm feels like jello for the next 24 hours. You will never experience that again in heaven. When we have hope, I have hope, I have absolute confidence that there is a God, there is heaven, and that's where I'm going to spend all eternity. And no, I have, I've admitted this many times, I don't have a death wish, I don't want to go today, but I feel many times like Paul, when he was struggling with, I want to be in heaven with my creator, yet I know there is still work here for me to do. That's called extreme faith. That while we're here, he will not waste a moment to spread the glory of God because he knows that he has run the race, he has fought the good fight, and where he is going, he will ne he's never experienced anything like it. We we've all had those great days. You know, you wake up and the day's just perfect. The coffee pot actually takes less than 30 minutes. Uh, ours is getting really old, so I know I need to get up at least a half an hour to 40 minutes before my coffee pot uh, or, or I'm just not going to get coffee in the morning because I'm leaving. But this time, the coffee pot worked in three minutes. Wouldn't that be a great morning? Come on, you just get up, hit the button, pff, instant coffee. You get your cup of coffee, it's instantly creamed and sugar. You didn't have to add anything because half the time I put sugar in it, half of it ends up on the counter, and if I don't get it all, then of course I'm in trouble. And then I grab my coffee, and it's just that perfect temperature. You know, not the too much that if I pour it on my lap, I'm going to get burned, but I'm not going to burn my mouth, but it's not cool, so that way it wakes me up. And then I get off to work, and there's no traffic. I used to love driving to the firehouse on Saturdays and Sundays, 57 to 294, because there was zero traffic. Zero traffic meant zero police officers. Zero police officers meant that I could drive as fast as I truly wanted to. Not that I necessarily sped the entire route, just part of it. Perfect day at the firehouse, I'd get there, no calls. If you could go 24 hours without a call, that was awesome. Because you'd clean the bathrooms, you'd get your stuff done, and then there's nothing else to do. So what do you got to do? Sit in the recliner and watch TV. That's why I think police officers are so jealous of firemen. They have to sit in their squad cars at a computer. We had an 80-inch screen, big screen TV and recliners. And we had cooks. There were some awesome cooks at the firehouse. That was a great day. But it was not perfect. What we're talking about here is take your best day ever. One of my best days is when my kids were born. One of my best days ever is when I married Denise. One of my best days ever is when I was baptized as a kid, even though I truly didn't understand it. Those were great days. But we're talking about days even better than that because one day I will get to hug my grandma and grandpa again. I will be welcomed home by family I never got to meet. I will be in a place of no pain, no sorrow, no sickness, nothing. And I 100% believe that that exists, and I 1,000% believe that's where I'm going. And that's what I hope today 
that when you walk out of there, there's never a question in your mind, well, I know I've done. The blood of Jesus can cover everything. I don't care what you've done. It can cover it. A minister uh, named Winston Lee was... uh, was the means of comforting and edifying great Dr. Samuel uh, Johnson on his deathbed. In a letter to a friend, Hannah Moore uh, alluded to this, and it says, I cannot conclude without remarking what honor God has hereby put upon the doctrine of faith in a crucified Savior. The man whose intellectual powers had awed all around him was in turn made to tremble when the period arrived, which all, know, all knowledge appears useless and vanishes away, except the knowledge of a true God and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, whom he sent. Effectively, to attain this knowledge, the giant in literature must become a fool, that he might become wise. What a comment this is upon the word. And we see in, in Isaiah, it says, The loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted on that day. Tell me that that doesn't sound like an awesome day. You know, we're even going through the book of Revelation in our Sunday school, the adult Sunday school class, and we're just getting to the exciting part. And what I mean by that is we're coming to see Babylon fall. We're seeing the devil thrown to hell. We're seeing uh, the false prophets and all these that are, are destroying our world today. They will be cast into the lake of sulfur, burning sulfur. And at that point, there'll be no more tears. Because hell will contain its own. And heaven will be made new. And Christ will will walk amongst us. That, to me, sounds like an amazing day. I, I, I can't wait. I, I love being here. I love being with you. I love being with my family. But man, talk about, that, that's like your choice of going to work like and have to really work that day or going to Hawaii. What would you choose? If somebody said, I need you to go work in a coal mine for the next 10 days solid, no shower, no food, or you get to go to Hawaii and stay at the nicest hotel with the best food. Which, what are you going to pick? Come on. Some of you are going to pick the coal mine. You're going to pick uh, Hawaii, right? And, and that's what we're at now. This is the dirty coal mine. This is where we get dirty. This is where we work. But someday, we will be in a place of magnificence, of glory, of the splendor of God. Yes, today I want you to absolutely be faithful in saying, I am going, and you can't stop me. There is no one in this world that can stop me because Christ beat death. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. We're going to be in... Uh, Acts chapter 7. And you may think of this and go, what is he thinking reading this? And we're not going to read all of it. Uh, Acts chapter 5, 6, and 7 are basically the institution of the deacons. It is the church. Remember, we have the Hellenistic uh, widows are saying we're not getting fed enough. The elders are like, we can't do it all. We're we're preaching, we're proclaiming, we're we're sharing, we're praying with people. We can't do it all. And so it is the institution of the first seven deacons. And so they they prayed about it, and these they f- found these seven. Stephen, they believe, is was probably about the oldest one. He was about twenty nine. He was born in, they believe, A.D. 5 and died in, in A.D. 34. So he was about 29 years old. So those that say, oh, I, I can't witness, uh, we're talking about kids. Timothy was in his late teens, early 20s when he became the lead pastor of a church. Don't tell me that you can't. Because many times we say, oh, I can't do that. It's I won't do that. I said for 50 years of my life, I will never be a pastor. And God said, <laughs> really? 
You're telling me what you won't be? Watch this. And here I am. God can do amazing things through you when you say, I can. He can, and I will let him. Stephen said the same thing. He, of course, is now proclaiming the good news of Christ. 29 years old, walking through the middle of the street, talking about Jesus, proclaiming his love for Christ, the Messiah who came, that was crucified by the same people he's talking to. And what happens? The Pharisees hear it. The scribes hear it. And they say, enough's enough, dude. Shut up already. And he's like, I can't. And then, of course, false witness came upon him. And they started making things up, and they brought him to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And they, they started falsely charging him and accusing him. And then we see, and when they heard this, they, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. I didn't realize that was a big thing, to gnash your teeth at someone, but that was actually a big sign in, in the New Testament and Old Testament. It's sort of like, have you ever gnashed your teeth? I didn't know that that was a term, gnashing of teeth necessarily, but when you grit your teeth, I'm like, if I don't grit my teeth, I'm going to hurt someone. We've all done it, but that was a symbol back then. If someone gnashed their teeth at you, they were not just really angry. They were opposed to you. They were against you. We have a lot of that today. You ever notice that if we say something, that we may have those that are adamantly against us? I don't have to agree with everybody, but I have to love them. I was watching a video yesterday, and it was a professor, and I don't remember, it was not a huge college, but it was a, a relatively big college, and the, the student actually videotaped the whole thing. And this teacher was basically harassing him because he said police officers were heroes. And she belittled him. She said, I can't believe you would ever say that. And he goes, well, what happens if somebody walks into your house with a gun? She's like, the last person I would ever call is a cop because I trust them less than the person with a gun. And I thought, I don't know what I thought, honestly. Interestingly enough, another student was in this little Zoom meeting. And the student, at least then, and I will give him this, he goes, I disagree with you. I don't like police officers. But I believe you have the freedom to say what you believe. Where the teacher did not. She shut off the Zoom meeting, said, you're done. We're not talking about this anymore. And the last quip was the friend going, listen, dude, I don't agree with you, but we're in America. You have the freedom to say what you have, what, what you believe. And he goes, and I, I, I commend you for believing and saying what you believe. Now, this isn't about police officers. This isn't about worldly things necessarily. But I wonder how many times we've been shut down on the premise of, our own mind saying, well, we might offend them. Well, I'm not saying we should walk out and offend them, but if we can't generally talk without offending somebody, then that's on them. If somebody asks me why I'm a Christian and then doesn't want to know the answer, that's on them. Don't ask me the question if you don't want my answer. I'm faithful knowing that Christ will lead me. And if I just take one seed out of that bag, and I plant a seat in someone's heart that the Holy Spirit can water and grow and flourish, maybe by somebody else, maybe by somebody in this room. Maybe you've planted a seed, and I'm able to water it. See, that's how Christian community works, is that we work together. We're a family. We're a team. If we're faithful in that, I believe that we can make the family grow, that we can, sh we can show the love of Christ to everyone. That's what this whole series has been about, is being faithful. Is being faithful right up to death. Let's keep going. Verse 55, but being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Do you get a chill when you read that, when you hear that? I'm telling you, I've read the scripture many times preparing for this lesson, and every time I get cold goosebumps up and down my back. 
Stephen is being faithful unto his death. He knows what is about to happen. Stephen being the very first martyr, 29-year-old man in the Bible that we see. And he didn't back down. They gave him an out, just shut up, don't say this anymore, and you know we'll, we'll whip you a few times and you can go on your way. And he said, I can't. I will proclaim the good news of Christ to everyone who comes by me because I know what Jesus did. And he was faithful to the very end. And at that very end, he saw the glory of God. He saw the heavens opened. He saw his creator. I've talked about it before. If, you've ever gotten, if you ever get a chance, read Fox's Book of Martyrs. You will see hundreds of of people that have been martyred for the name of Christ. And it's amazing to me how many of them burned at the stake by the church. Given it out. All you got to do is just stop saying it. Just stop. And they couldn't. They were so full of the Holy Spirit that they just had to tell people what the Bible said. And being burned at the stake, I, I guess I picture this. I've been burned in fires before. It's painful. It hurts. And these people being filled with the Holy Spirit, being burned at the stake, looked toward heaven and never cried, never complained, never screamed out, only gave God glory. I don't know how we're going to die. I don't know how you're going to die. I don't know how I'm going to die. It could be a car accident on my way home. It could be a heart attack in the next three minutes. Not planning on it. But when we reach our end, if we can look up and see the glory of God, that's being faithful to death. Because it's just the death of this outwardness. Let's keep going. But they cried out in a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him in one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside the robes at the, young, at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. And having said that, he fell asleep. I love that. See, when we die, Jesus said, you, if you believe in me, you will never die. What does that mean? These outward bodies, yeah, yeah, they're toast, they're worm food. But what lives inside of this shell of a thing is who I am. And that will never experience death. I may fall asleep, and when I awake, I will be in the presence of Jesus. Think about that. Death should not fear us. And we should not fear death. It's going to happen to each and every one of us. The outward body will fail. But it's what you believe on the inside that will be where you go. And you have two choices, at least in my opinion, in what the Bible says. You can either be with gnashing of teeth and weeping burning sulfur for the rest of all eternity, or you could be in the splendor and glory of God with a tree of life that has 12 different fruits every month for the healing of nations and a beautiful river that runs through it to satisfy the quench of anyone. I don't know about you, I'm all about the potluck, so I'm going for the 12 fruits on the tree. I'm going for the, the, uh, the hug of my Savior going, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what I strive for. You know, I, I remember when I first went to Bible college, my aunt made a pillow and she put down, uh, working for the Lord may not pay much, but the retirement plan is out of this world. And amen to that. And that's for everyone. I don't care how much money you got in the bank right now. It's nothing compared to walking on streets of gold. And I used to think of that as being something that's, that's really big, right? Walking on streets of gold. It's an illustration to say that money means nothing in heaven. And the streets can be full of gold and you're not going to care. It'll be just like dirt because it won't matter anymore. 
that gold will mean nothing. You can take and try to chip it away all you want to. It will mean nothing there because you will be completely satisfied by the glory of your king. Are you faithful in that someday you are going to heaven? Do you truly believe that? I don't, I don't want you to ever question that again. I don't want you to ever think, boy, I hope so. I want you to emphatically say, I'm going. And if you want to go with me, jump in the Monza. Because I got a couple more uh, inches back there. I'll squeeze you in. That's, as a Christian, what we should say. In the face of death, a genuine Christian manifests a calm, victorious spirit. Shortly before his passing, a friend asked John Quincy Adams um, how he was. The old man, feeble but not despondent, answered, Mr. Adams was never better, but the house in which he lives is weather-beaten and showing some signs of age and decay. So Mr. Adams is getting his effects together and preparing to move out. Man, I love that. Trust me. I'm going to get a body that's big and strong. I'm in. I've been trying that for 54 years and it hasn't worked yet. I'm going to get a brand new body that never breaks down, never sore, never tired, has hair, can sing like the angels. Praise God. I'm ready. Trade it in. Let's go. Victor Hugo's life drew near as it was coming to a close. He said, winter is on my head, but eternal spring is in my heart. When I go down to the grave, I cannot say I have finished my life. My day's work will begin again the next morning. The tomb is not a blind alley. It is a thoroughfare. It closes, on the, it closes in on the twilight to open with the dawn. Paul's very last letter that he wrote, he says, I am ready for the time of my departure is at hand. The word translated departure literally means unloosening, as when the sailor unloosens their boats and puts out to sea. Are you ready today? No, I'm not going to ask you to drink any funky Kool-Aid as you walk out. But are you ready today to go see your maker? Are your affairs in order and you could say, no, I've got kids to raise. No, I've got grandkids to raise. No, I've got to finish this project at work. No, I've got more work to do. And everything you said is worldly. If you said, no, I've got more souls to save, then praise God. What work are you doing? That project at work, trust me, there's 10 other people that will pick it up, run with it, and they will never miss you at all. It doesn't matter. Your kids will miss you. Your family will miss you. But if they have the hope of Jesus, they're only missing you for a short time because one day you'll be waiting for them or they'll be waiting for you and you will be reunited to never be separated again. That's having faith in death. That's having faith that the Creator sent His Son. His Son died, beat death, took away sin that you can stand at the foot of the glory of God at his throne and say, Dad, I'm home. Can you imagine God jumping off the throne that he sits on and hugging you going, man, I have been waiting, dude, for a long time. That's having the faith that upon the death of this outward body, you will be with God. You will be with Jesus. It's going to be an amazing day. And having said this, he fell asleep. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives, believes in me, will never die. Do you believe this? He said. My question to you right now, do you believe this? That he who believes in him will never die. Because if you believe it, then emphatically say, I will not die. I don't fear death. I don't fear what death brings because I'm not going to die. This worm food 
maggots, whatever, knock your socks off. Because what's in my heart and what's in my mind will be reunited with the perfect body one day. Are you faithful even to the end? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. When we set our eyes on the prize before us, no one can take the prize away. All we have to do is be faithful, be diligent, and be ready. Because someday it's coming. Death is not the end. It is only the beginning. W, or J.W. Howitt said this. Death is not the master of the house. He is only the porter at the king's lodge, appointed to open the gate and let the king's guests into the realm of eternal day, so that we will never, or so that we shall always be with the Lord. The range of our threescore years and ten is not the limit of our life. Our life is not a landlocked lake enclosed within the shorelines of seventy years. It is the arm of the sea, and so we must build for these larger waters. We are immortal. How then shall we live today in a prospect of eternal tomorrow? How do you live right now preparing for that day? Is the question that I will leave you. Do you believe you will never die? And if you truly believe that, if your heart is in tune with Christ, if you have the faith in your Creator, if you believe without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus came and walked and died and rose again, is now standing at the right hand of the Father, ready to come and bring you home. If you believe that, you have nothing to fear. Death cannot take you. What do I see for your future? If you give your life to Christ, I see life. And I see life abundantly. And I see life gloriously. And I see life beautifully. I see life with stained glass windows and the sun, S-O-N, shine through every day. I have got a vivid imagination and I'm telling you, Heaven is going to be far grander than what I can imagine, and I am so excited. And I'm faithful that Jesus said, you will never die. Bill, you'll never die if you believe in me. When somebody asks you, if somebody asks you this week, hey, do you think you're going to heaven? And that's your chance to say, praise God, I'm going, and the mons is open. Come on, let me show you how to get there. Because right now you're hurting. I know you're hurting. But I can show you how to have peace and joy and hope and love everlasting. Come with me in the Monza. If I got to put a trailer on the back, I'm putting a trailer on the back but we're going. Father, we praise you for these words. We thank you for the series of just faith, just to remind us that we need to be faithful. The world is so trying to tear us apart and make us question, yet the world can't define any answers. They've never disproved who God is. They only want to sugarcoat and cover. Father, I truly believe that you're the creator of all things. I truly believe that you sent your son to die for us, and I truly believe that you have the Holy Spirit right now, part of who you are residing in me. I truly believe that I'm, on my greatest days you are there. I believe on my worst days you are there. Father, I believe that no matter what happens to me in this world, as I know there will be trials and tribulations and sadness and struggles, that it is not anything that Jesus didn't go through. And yet remaining faithful will bring me to the end of this life, but the beginning of eternity, of awesomeness, of beautiful, of I, I, 
just can't even truly understand how incredible it's going to be. But most of all, I know I will be with you where you reside. And that's good enough for me. Father, thank you for allowing one such as I, a sinner, one that was lost, to know that one day I will be home with my dad and my brother and all my family that believe. Father, praise you. Thank you for that. Father, I pray for each one here today that as they walk out, they can definitively, emphatically, strongly say, I know where I'm going. And I want to take everyone I can with me. Give us strength in that. Give us peace in that, Father. We ask all this in Jesus' holy and beautiful name. Amen.